Yes, welcome back. Uh, we're very honored today to have a colleague and dear friend, Laura Magdalene Eisenhower. Welcome, Laura. Hi, Alfred. Great to be here. Um, we we asked. We're we're very honored to have you here today, and uh, you have just come back from the uh, 22nd World Symposium on UFOs, extraterrestrials, uh, that was held in Europe in San Marino. Could you tell us a bit about that event and its significance? Well, what I, from what I heard, it's um, the equivalent of the citizens' hearing disclosure um, for Italy. And uh, I was invited by Roberto Pinotti, um, a few months back and basically this was an opportunity to share with whoever attended um, also with the Italian press and um, it made it to mainstream news and you know the significance is that this is being heard and taken seriously and that um, we all have an opportunity to just you know look at this information for what it is and that's really how I presented it I really wanted to warm the audience up, you know, especially for those who haven't heard it before. This is the kind of topic that can easily be sort of brushed off, and there's a bit of an art to how this gets presented, which was part of my struggle. Like, okay, how do I, you know, word this? It's 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 just a lot. But um, they've been working so hard at getting this sort of information out, and I was just really honored to be invited. And I think, you know, it's had some uh, what of a ripple effect. Um, I've heard from a lot of people who saw it on mainstream news that said, oh yeah, we saw you on TV addressing this stuff and, you know, and as we know with the internet, um, things just tend to spread at their own timing, but I think, you know, this was just a really good opportunity to get it out there to those that might have the ability to, you know, really do something from the inside out. Right. Now, uh, all of us know, of course, that you're the great granddaughter of President Dwight D. Eisenhower and that uh, you remain very close to him and to his spirit and that uh, you've declared that uh, your one of your missions is to continue the Eisenhower legacy um, and uh, it struck me that uh, in a very very powerful statement written lecture and public statement that you delivered at this summit, which we're going to provide a link to, uh, uh, to an article in the video description so people can really read this and get the full impact. Uh, you say, quote, there has been a massive cover-up in regards to ET contact with our governments and there has been much secrecy in regards to those who have been either abducted or contacted. And this is the key, you say, this is because an invasion has already taken place and they don't want us to know this. You've, I mean, that's the clearest that I've ever heard anyone say this <laughs> about an invasion. Could you walk us through all of those thoughts? Yes, well, I mean, the galactic history, um, I mean, there's so much to it, and we're dealing with a lot of galactic wars, angelic wars that took place even before this planet was formed, this planet that we know it as Gaia, um, and so I've studied a lot about that, and in the formation of this new creation, it was uh, pretty much hijacked immediately, and um, we're dealing with, you know, reptilians that ended up going underground, not necessarily malevolent but then those coming from the Draco star system and uh, just how the Anunnaki and the Luciferian rebellion um, is a part of the enslavement of humanity and we hear all these stories about the Anunnaki with Enki and Enlil and all these different projections and theories about you know what their intentions are Enlil has been somewhat demonized as being the one who created the flood and Enki is out for our good because he wanted to protect humankind but what is really protecting humankind when there's an enslavement agenda so we're dealing with beings that actually want a large population in order to control it and then other factions that want to um, 
somewhat create population control and then the reptilians that went underground that were a part of the original creation that just see this huge mess and probably want um, it to be rectified or uh, brought to some kind of justice and so we're dealing with many different species and the invasion part of it would be the manipulation, the mind control, the uh, dark technologies that want to control nature, want to control humans, um, anything from the aerosol spring and you know harp technologies to um, what we see in the media and what we see coming from religion and governments. You know this this mass manipulation where most people don't even recognize what's going on because it seems to be a part of just the human experience, and it's that level of manipulation and control that I would say is the invasion that has been in the works for um, thousands and thousands of years. And so when we deal with something like the Illuminati or um, some of these shadow government institutions, there's many factions and they're kind of doing this infighting, but they're all vying for control of the human race. It's not really about our sovereignty. It's not about allowing us to see what the truth is so that we can all discuss it and know what we're voting for and know what we're putting our attention on. Instead, it's like we're kind of hanging on the outside as the byproduct of all these games and we're just being sort of like caught in the middle like some sort of tug of war and the invasion I mean we can look at it like some sort of alien invasion or we can see it as a um, the role of what the negative ego plays and how we've attached ourselves to it and how we're enabling this and so when we see what's happening in our world you know we have to look at the signs we have to recognize uh, what's obvious you know particularly looking up and seeing that we're being sprayed and do something about it and not just sit there and assume that um, our best interests are being looked out for and even though there's you know factions within these groups that are trying to help us there's too much criminal activity going on for us to stand on the sidelines anymore and that was my intention is to say it's gonna take the whole human race and it's time to put all this out there regardless of what the outcome is or who can handle it or not handle it, it doesn't matter anymore. We have to all be a part of this discussion. We have to unite with the ones that are on our side. We have to call out the ones who aren't, give them an opportunity to either unify with us or um, you know, we need to have them shut down what they're doing or you know, just like you with your, your deep understanding of law, bring justice to this, this, this issue we're dealing with, these many issues we're dealing with. Now, now you start out by going to a series of secret treaties that started around 1933, both in the United States and in Nazi Germany. Could you talk about all of these developments? Yes. When we hear about treaties, we very often only hear about treaties with Eisenhower. And in fact, um, the treaties originated with Roosevelt um, and also Hitler. And what they both encountered was the Pleiadians and both were turned down by the, both the Nazis and our American government um, in favor of the Greys and their technology. For the Nazis it seems that they got the mind control technology and for the US government it seems it was more about you know metals and alloys and free energy and things that would just improve our life but it wasn't until Project Paperclip after the Second World War got into you know the American government that the mind control technology came and that's where uh, Montauk and other projects started to become infiltrated and the technology you know was used um, in somewhat of a negative way I think originally some of these technologies were to help us with the potential threats um, as a form of defense and a lot of these defense industries have been infiltrated and now it's just about you know who's using these technologies for you know control and um, and I also feel that the Zionists and the Nazis are within this shadow government and they're somewhat on the same team kind of like sort of a chess game between themselves that we're on the outside of and it was funny because right before the talk I just kept having my inner voice you know say checkmate this is your checkmate you know this is your ch <laughs> chance to corner them and just say this is like game over because if we're gonna have any part of the game it's time for the game to be over with and so you know when we look at the treaties originating then and the amount of infiltration that happened by the time Ike stepped into office it's not very clear you know if it was even him that signed the treaties people like James Casbolt who now you know is, is somewhat somebody I, I might not necessarily want to quote but he has said that you know these were cloned humans all that aside when we look at other whistleblower testimony what the main theme seems to be is that this was not about signing a treaty it was more about surrender 
and that the Nordics weren't necessarily turned down. It was that they just weren't able to reach an agreement with each other because there were so many differing viewpoints. And because the shadow government had already been established and MJ-12 had already been established, it was more that infighting that we're seeing, which didn't enable a very concise decision to be made. And in that indecisiveness, the Greys ended up coming in with their technology and we didn't have any way to defend ourselves. And, um, but it was all planned out this way. This is the thing with what we're dealing with. This isn't, you know, some sort of spontaneous thing and, oh, whoops, we made a deal and sold ourselves to the Greys. I mean, this was all strategically planned and it connects with the Rockefellers and the Bilderbergs, you know, so that these exchanges would happen and uh, it would be maybe blamed on somebody like Ike or somebody else. But um, it was all a part of the strategy all along. So, so that what you're saying is that the, the various technologies that started coming in in the 30s, both on the, on the Nazi side, these are the, these are the, Draco, the Draco technologies on the Nazi side and on the U.S. side, uh, uh, that manifested as mind control and that manifested as other advanced technologies, that the rollout of these in our time space society here this is really the impos this is the invasion this is the et invasion that we see now through harp and what you call the tablets of destiny supercomputer system is that what you call that, that that's how the et invasion is taking place Right, and then it links back to the mythologies and, and stuff about the Divine Feminine and the galactic history connected with the Orions and the Syrians and the Anunnaki, and that all goes into such great depth that I try and uh, really put out there in my presentations. It's sometimes just a huge amount of stuff to try and articulate in a few sentences, but from what I've understood um, when we're dealing with you know the, the Roswell crash and other crashes that took place and you know all the different technologies that were... Um, exchange for abductions and you know using human genetics in order to help a dying race which is what they said you know they're a dying race and they need our assistance and that they would only abduct a few we have to look at my labs and the fact that the military you know got involved and started to clone or create hybrids or create these automations that appear to be real abductions and I think that's what ended up getting out of control and why there are so many abduction scenarios is because of the military involvement but when we're dealing with these greys we're not just dealing with extraterrestrials we're dealing with future human selves that have time traveled back that are trying to keep a life cycle alive rather than be on the ascension path where they wouldn't need our human genetics they would have connection to spirit be the regenerative quality of being able to keep their race alive, which is what we as humans have access to. And so we have a choice right now whether we're going to turn into greys by kind of giving ourselves over to these control agendas, whether it's through ignorance and not realizing it or just kind of giving up and, um, you know, not taking a stand, or we have the ability to be these advanced beings that we truly are that do not need to time travel back to take our own genetic material. And so to me this is what the shadow government does and all those that they have gathered into their um, agenda in order to stay um, somewhat immortal and that's their way of cheating um, I guess facing the karmic backlash of, of, of their negative and evil ways. Yeah, now in your statement uh, talking about the, the, the ET invasion that, that has happened that the governments don't want to talk about, you write, um, uh, it, uh, a whistleblower states that the military-industrial extraterrestrial complex is currently using a Tablets of Destiny supercomputer system that includes the HARP aerosol chemtrail and artificial intelligence mind control system to attempt planetary ecocide and genocide. He states that the Plydean fleet is here to liberate humanity and will be successful. Could you explain more about the Tablets of Destiny and about the interplay with the Plydean fleet and what's, what dynamic is going on now that ultimately the Plydeans will be successful? Well, from what I understand, the Tablets of Destiny connect to Tiamat, which is an ancient primordial goddess energy, and it's really what this planet was before it became Earth. It ended up imploding um, and a portion of it became Earth and the rest of it became 
uh, part of the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. And all those asteroids have different qualities like Vesta, you know, and, you know, all these different names that we can see, you know, in astrology. But the Tablets of Destiny ended up getting into the wrong hands, which became sort of this technological um, system and what we know is the artificial matrix that sort of runs the show that people are connected to. And when we think about the nanoparticles coming in from the aerosol spraying with the attempt to create sort of an antenna to mind control us so that we're easily surveillance and easily watched and monitored while we're also being bombarded with these heavy metals that keep us in a low density and sort of imprison our aura and which doesn't enable us to ascend. Um, this is basically a tablets of destiny that was once more of a soul um, alchemical process which has now become a technological control system that has taken and used this information as a weapon against us and that's where our energy which is free energy is being siphoned away from us and being used against us as a weapon as well and so when we look at weather modification and mind control basically our vital energy and the earth's the prana is being siphoned away because we're giving our power away by believing in the false flags and believing in the media distortions and then it's being used to fuel these technologies and the tablets of destiny when they were in the hands of the goddess or the original planets it was more about cosmic law and it was more about the um, development of um, you know different races and the seeding of different races that were in tune with these energies as they were an emanation of it. Now we're dealing with ego and we're dealing with soul. We're dealing with free will and we're dealing with, you know, the, the tree of knowledge and the tree of good and evil in order to get ourselves back to what we used to be. And we're given these choices in order to bypass where the tablets of destiny have gone so that we can reclaim the original um, tablets that get kind of complicated because it's like, well, how, how, how can one really explain it? But it's like anything, what the archons do, they imitate and they imitate the creation and this is what artificial timelines do they can take and simulate realities that are manufactured that aren't organic that appear to be reality and this is kind of what we're dealing with compared to the organic ascension and um and it's just you know it just has gotten into the wrong hands and a lot of it you know we can read about in myths as far as how the tablets ended up in so-and-so's hands and you know what you know sort of happened and it's part of the deception of the Luciferian rebellion what ended up happening 26,000 years ago in Lucifer uh, the Lucifer rebellion was um, the establishment of the Nephilim reversal grid which is in um, Stonehenge it's underground there and basically these supercomputers um, end up affecting the ley lines and the vortexes and keep the planet sort of hijacked and in sort of a uh, a locked position of not being able to open its own natural stargates but we're connected to the natural stargates and when our consciousness expands we're able to override these technological manipulations but they're all over the place I mean we're dealing with probably about 4,000 underground bases and um, when we think about the dark rituals and the, the places that they choose to do these things they're in very you know powerful places and the different alignments that take place are usually when they do them because those are the times that we take a huge leap in consciousness that they want to keep us from doing so it's just kind of like an energy game it's frequency battle and it's all about you know a battle for our consciousness but at the end of the day there's nothing that is more powerful than spirit it's just these technologies and this mind control and this aerosol spraying and the chemtrails are all to just keep us locked into um, a dumbed down version of ourselves that, that can't access what we're truly made of. But once we get a hold of it and once we connect with it, nothing can dumb it down. It's just in this opportunity that we have during this shift time, during the stellar activation cycle, which is between 2012 and 2017, where most people will awaken. This is where they're doing extra spraying and doing more to keep us from becoming empowered. But so many of us have been empowered for so long, even before this shift time, that we're able to kind of hold the space and hold the ground to invite others to join us. And so once you arrive, you know, there's no turning back, but they're trying to stifle people from actually arriving. And that's where people like you and me are trying to share the information before it's too late. Now, right. Now, uh, in your talk, you, you talk about uh, uh, 
the establishment of, uh, you know, first the, the, the establishment through the Office of Strategic Services, OSS, and then the establishment of Operation Paperclip, which what it seemed on the surface was to deny German scientific expertise and knowledge to the Soviet Union and to the UK. But then uh, it seemed uh, that, a again, a whistleblower stated that the CIA was really created uh, to, to handle the massive number of mind-controlled cloning and o other covert projects that were brought over from Paperclip. And so this is, and so the CIA was really created as the mechanism to bring uh, uh, first North America and then the world with the, with the American empire into uh, this purported uh, draconian mind control empire, global mind control empire. I mean, that, that, that seems what, what you were, were revealing here. Is that the case? Yes, and, and, and that's why we also deal with, you know, so much disinformation. And, you know, when we're dealing with the draconians, we're also dealing with the Nordics, but when we look at the ancient history and the Nephilim, you know, both of these were fallen races. And so people think all Palladians are good and all reptilians are bad. That's not the case. It's just as diverse as the human population with all the different races amongst us. Um, the Dracos pretty much seem to be the most negative, but there's many species of reptilians, many species of um, beings out there. And it just depends if, you know, it's service to self or service to others at the end of the day. But what it seems to be, you know, as far as the CIA and these three-letter organizations are a mix of of both and um, you know some that have all joined together and some that are still trying to get things back on track so I think there's some factions of the CIA that aren't all about those cover-ups but for the most part the whole establishment was created in order to you know handle the secrecy and um, you know keep this agenda and this invasion quiet because the invasions happened a long time ago and so the false ET invasion that they talk about in the future and the blue beam technologies that might or probably have been, you know, they're not going to happen, but there's no real invasion that can happen when we've already been invaded. And so if they present scenarios that make it look like we're getting invaded for the first time, that's where they start to introduce the next level of their new world order agenda. And when we deal with the economy and the potential collapse of the economy, more than likely it's a controlled collapse and that's when we start to get chipped. And so nothing that we're going to get from the governments, I feel, is going to be truth, and that's why disclosure needs to come from us. And wherever truth is, is something that should be brought out and discussed, and wherever there's secrecy is where the big red flags are, and there's no excuse for this secrecy. And I can understand, in which I wrote about in the paper, when we're dealing with um, these different um, threats that uh, many people have dealt with, and some of the penalties for those that have signed oaths, um, you know, what happens to them for expressing truth. Most of the whistleblowers that I quoted aren't even alive anymore. You know, it's understandable for those that have kept things secret for those type of reasons, but we're in a whole new generation now, and it's up to us to, you know, expose all of this. And as complicated as the information is, the, right, the, the, the paper that's written out is a little bit more easy to probably process um, the progression of all of this. But, um, you know, it's the infighting that's the challenging part because we tend to just assume that all those in the CIA or the Illuminati or the shadow government are negative, but we also have to understand that there are some that, you know, are trying to help us. And so a lot of my intention for my presentation was to call out to those people and say, hey, guess what? We are ready. And it's time that you allowed us to have a voice because we were born with solutions. And even during the Ike's administration, there was some um, need for secrecy because they couldn't figure out the intentions of the Greys or who was good or who wasn't good. And that was another reason why they didn't disclose stuff. But, you know, this is a time now that we have to get it all out on the table. And there's going to be gray areas and confusing parts to it. But we all have a different part of the conversation to share so that we can start to connect the dots. Right. Now, let's start getting into the various alternatives 
and alternatives one, two, and three, and and uh, the role that your great grandfather started a, an organization that began developing those. Could you begin to talk about those? Well, something called the Jason Scholars or the Jason Society was set up, and it was considered to be the scientific branch of MG12. And basically, it was to handle um, a lot of the different information coming in as far as where the human destiny or what trajectory we were on as a human race. And what seems to have been communicated from the Zetas, which are the greys that um, the treaties were, you know, potentially signed with, I think there's more than one species that were involved, um, you know, had to do with these alternatives. And a lot of it was presented uh, to the governments or those that were at the meetings that there was a catastrophic future that we were in for and these alternatives were to protect us. But when you look at where we are today and we know that there are super storms that are being created and weather is not coming from mother nature, what happens to our weather is not necessarily a natural thing, then what kind of disasters and catastrophes are we talking about? Are they simulated? Are they, um, you know, designed and crafted to create this, you know, artificial Armageddon scenario? Or is this something, you know, legitimate and we need to get off planet and go to underground bases and begin to protect the human genome? So I think that was a huge part of the confusion. Um, those that I think are on our side kept the, these things secret to, to, to try and figure this out or their lives were threatened. Um, but we know that we did not have the technologies or the means to know to go off planet without some sort of intervention or some sort of dialogue with an off planet race. From what I understand, these were future human selves and that these greys were coming from different times uh, from the future, different timelines. And uh, some say that, you know, they wanted to help us and they, you know, needed our genetic material and that they wanted to help us to establish underground bases and off planet colonies to protect us which is alternative three, which you, um, me, and Andrew Bishago get heavy into with uh, exposing all that we can about what's happening on Mars, which you guys are just, you know, have the top-notch information um, about. And, of course, Andrew with his participation in Project Pegasus. And so when we look at the defense programs, you know, it's, it's easy to say, and we both, you know, agreed upon the fact that, yes, it's a good idea to protect the human genome in the event of catastrophe, but... From what I'm gathering and from what I've experienced and seen, just like many others, we're not dealing with anything natural here and we've been dealing with these control technologies for so long that it's not good to just go along with these agendas and alternatives, especially when we see what MJ-12 is made of and what these shadow governments are made of and all the criminal activity that goes on, all our tax dollars that are being spent, all the abuses that are taking place and all the atrocities that are taking place, none of these alternatives make sense. So what only really makes sense to me is what I've termed alternative four, which is the power of the human spirit, the exposure of truth, the transparency of um, all this information so that we can make informed decisions as a human race. And from there, I think we stand the best chance of protecting ourselves. Because in the end, we know that we can survive death. We know that we live on, but we certainly cannot deal with these control agendas anymore and the potential future of becoming either gray extraterrestrials or being separate or away from our planetary body that we're extensions of, that we're deeply, deeply connected to. And so it's interesting because the exopolitical aspect of it, the mythological aspect of it, the soul component of what we're truly made of and what our divine blueprint is and what our DNA is capable of is beyond all these things. And to, to have anybody try and run the show and keep us as advanced beings from being a part of it makes little sense because you know, we have highly advanced DNA and this is part of the invasion and part of the whole nature of all of this is that they don't want us to wake up to what we're truly made of because it puts them in a position of not being able to be parasites anymore. And so um, this is uh, what you, me and Andy have, uh, or Andy, you and I, uh, get my grammar right, but you know what I mean? This is what we're attempting to really put out there is... Um, you know, Andrew are wanting to run for president, you, you know, putting out all this incredible research information and books, and uh, me speaking out as much as I can, and just all of us, what are we doing? We're empowering the human spirit, and we're empowering um, truth, and, you know, from there, I think our creative energy works with the elements, works with Mother Earth, works with the cosmos, works with spirit, and that, from there, is where miracles, transmutation, and alchemy comes from, and that's where we call 
all our energy back from these dark technologies and we really begin to work with um, you know the organic ascension timeline and everything else crumbles from there right right so taking then the key of the positive timeline and looking at the catastrophic timeline and going back to say uh, uh, the quote ET invasion as more let's let's rename that the catastrophic timeline do you think that 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 was say uh, a group of uh, Dracos attempting to impose a catastrophic timeline on this dimension do, yes, do, do you think that, that that that's what they were attempting to do yeah and that's why I feel that the alternatives were all set up as a ploy to kind of deceive us into thinking that this is what we needed when all along they, they, they were planning to create the catastrophes for us to you know go off planet to then you know do the population control to create the new world order and to you know get basically humanity enslaved while they kind of hide off to these other places while this all happens um, from what I understand and you know folks like Dan Bursch have said that they they want to be on the catastrophic timeline because that's their best bet for them to have control over us and even if it compromises them it's worth it in the end because as we know they have all the technologies to be able to you know terraform or regenerate certain things um, but not to the level that spirit can and what we're made of you know these are just simulations these are um, you know things that aren't very compatible with um, you know our, 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 our human structure and that's why the hybridization needed to take place because what they're trying to do is create a physical embodiment of something that can handle these level of attacks radiation and all these different types of things um, and of course it goes back to the Nephilim and some of these you know deeper things that happened in our ancient history um, as to why the desire to not redeem the self and be on the ascension path um, was never taken and the desire to be in control you know has superseded that and that's where the automations come in the um, the cloning because the thing is with the radiation us humans wouldn't be able to stand that our reproductive organs you know wouldn't work anymore and we would end up becoming you know like these grays but when you're dealing with the reptilian overlords that are overseeing this that are actually modifying humans they did this to the Nordics on other planets turn them into grays um, and we see a history of humanoids becoming grays the reptilian overlords you know don't aren't don't really have to worry about that and so the ones that they're convincing are the ones that might be assisting them but have no idea that this is the future that they're creating for themselves but some do know and and that's you know what we're dealing with is that these future human selves are time traveling back trying to warn us and help us but at the same time the ones that are under their total control aren't trying to help us at all they're trying to assist them in achieving this agenda because they don't care to better themselves um, because this is like the race for a soul to have a body because there's so many souls that don't have bodies that they want to create an artificial creation to house anything that they possibly can if that makes sense yeah yeah that that does so if we re-envision and try to trace down where the catastrophic timeline came from because this invasion they operate say from somewhere in 4D would would you say that? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Now, let's go to the biblical prophecies, you know, which lay out uh, sort of the end time, you know, the, the earthquake and, and the end time er, er, earthquake, kind of the, the, the gl global cl coastal events where, where these, they're, they're the, you know, the Planet X events happen, all the coastal cities are destroyed uh, type event and I first started looking at this uh, through the prophecies of, of, of Edgar Casey, who, who kind of remote viewed a global coastal event happening somewhere around this time and that's what the biblical prophecies are looking out 
app for is a global coastal event. And then our colleague Andy, he actually went down in a, in a chronovisor and saw the Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. In, in June of 2013 under 100 feet of brackish water, i.e. that's when you have a global coastal event. Some great meteor or something hits and the whole world gets flooded. Uh, but that's like an adjacent timeline. Like, that is not the timeline that we're on. We're on a positive timeline. It, it, it's like all of this is like some great force was was tuning into, like the prophets and the, some psychics were like tuning into this this uh, sideline, catastrophic timeline, and then projecting it onto us. Yes. You know, like like in the Old Testament or even in the New Testament and, and Edgar Casey and all, and then projecting all this catastrophe and then people say, oh, is it time yet? But it's it's not real. It's not what's happening. And that that's part of the invasion. Could Could you comment on that? Yes, and I think it connects, you know, to the fallen watchers in the... Um you know, how the composite of Yahweh is more the fallen watchers and the way that it ended up becoming the imposter god that we, you know, would, would, would hear about all these kind of biblical prophecies, but it's really coming from a timeline where, you know, technologies are used to create these events. And if they were natural and are natural, we would be handling it in a totally different way because we're multidimensional beings and we don't see it through the eyes of you know, fear. We would see it through the eyes of, you know, understanding that, you know, death and rebirth and creation and destruction is all a part of, you know, who we are and what we are. So if it was um, natural, that would be a positive timeline because what is natural always regenerates itself, always repairs itself. And even when, you know, the first creation, you know, ended up being a wasteland and in total darkness, everything came back to life again. And that's the Genesis story. And that did come from a true creator force. But then the fallen watchers got involved, altered all the information, um, you know, changed all the uh, stories, uh, especially the Christ story, um, you know, demonized and projected on the, the, the divine feminine. And, and we're not getting the truth. And history has been rewritten. and They've done it before. And it's part of the mind control and it's a part of, you know, using time travel and quantum access, access technologies to change past events so that the information that we get and that we get educated about gives us a completely different idea of what the history is that isn't true, which creates a false future because we're not dealing with anything that's actually real. And so it's so awesome, you know, to really, you know, hit home these sort of things because, you know, it's not unnatural for, you know, catastrophes to happen, you know, on a natural level. But when it comes from creator, it doesn't necessarily wipe out huge populations unless it's such a virus and such a disease that it's no different than what we do in our human body when we try and maintain health and wellness and balance. It's part of, you know, cosmic law and the organism of creation as a whole, not, you know, entities that want to be our gods that are making these choices for us while we're being kept in the dark. It's much more of a natural equilibrium balancing act that we do every day as human beings. So there's a, if, if anybody wants to, you know, really understand what's natural and what isn't, just understand the laws of the human body and consciousness and the soul and the ego and how we run ourselves on a daily basis and look at the larger picture and start to, you know, compare the two. And, um, you know, we, we, we manifest all sorts of things to bring us back to the wisdom and truth of what we need to know and understand. But when we give that power away to anything outside of us and it dictates to us where we're headed, what disease we have, what the prognosis is, where we're heading as a humanity, what the biblical prophecies are, then this is where we've given our power away. And this is where this window period has been so projected upon as having all these different disasters and Armageddon scenarios taking place when it's really the window period of our awakening and our expansion into higher earth energies and our multidimensional nature. And whatever gets destroyed in that process doesn't matter when we hold that perspective. But it's these false simulations and these false stories that put us in fear that actually enable these things to happen because we believe it's real. Right, right. Um, uh, so, so how does one access then the real story about what's happening which is the positive timeline. That seems to be the real story. So how do we access the real story so we can tell that story? 
I think just the more we feel into everything and the more we fall back on ourselves, no matter how uncomfortable it is, the better off we are. Um, I mean, there's, there's just so much information coming out that we're constantly bombarded with. And if we don't develop intuition and discernment, you know, it's just easy to just kind of like take it all in and say, okay, and make a decision sort of from our superficial mind rather than our deep inner knowing and, you know, inner gnosis. And, you know, we have a divine blueprint. We have advanced DNA. You know, a lot of it is dormant. So how do we activate it? You know, we need to just let sound, frequency, color, and, and, and all sorts of things, you know, raise our vibration. We need to, you know, understand natural law and cosmic law and stop listening to, you know, humans and all the propaganda. And, and we have to, like, notice the things that bother us and not be so controlled by it. When we look up at the sky and we see the chemtrails, we have to understand that this shift time we're in is about spirit being more powerful than matter. You know, it's important to create justice. It's important to speak out. It's important to say, hey, this is wrong. But we don't need to be crushed by it. We don't need to allow our energies to constrict. Because the thing is, if it were just enough for chemtrails to enslave humanity, they would just spray us. But no, it, it takes mind control as well. And the two work together, and that's why there's nanoparticles. It's not just us having heavy metals in us and being sick and giving our money away and keeping the economy alive, which is a part of why they do it. It's also the mind control. It's us believing in all the distortions, and that's the trap. Once we allow ourselves to stay stuck in the lower density mentality, then we are easily affected by these nanoparticles and chemtrails. But when we say, hey, that's not the true nature of the masculine and feminine, that news is false, these leaders are not here to help us, and we begin to fall back on ourselves and each other, then we are, we're already in the mode of transmuting all these negative assaults and all these toxins and all the radiation and all these you know, nanoparticles from, from taking us over. And the consciousness, is, it's going to start there. It's going to start with our own energy and our, our ability to create belief systems and perceptions that um, utilize the power that we're made of rather than us thinking that it's not there, which is a part of what they're trying to do in dumbing us down. They can only dumb us down through our belief systems, you know, and, and all these particles are a part of it. But if we override the mental and mind control aspects of it, the particles don't have anything to really grab onto. I mean, the two really do work together. That's why when you think about it, shows like Ripley's Believe It or Not, or people that can eat light bulbs, you know, and get away with it, they understand mind over matter. There's a lot of people that do. That's available for all of us. We have to know that everything's a metaphor that we're seeing. We're, we're in this crazy lucid dream and it doesn't look pretty. It's somewhat of a nightmare right now, but it's a shift that's on the inside. This whole shift time that we're in is an internal shift that creates an outer result. And once we get a grip on what we need to wake up to within ourselves, we're going to change everything outside of us. If we keep reacting and responding and getting angry and feeling constricted and, and assuming that you know they're, they've got something on us, then that's exactly what is going to end up happening. And we're much greater than that. And this is all they want to keep us from knowing is what we're truly made of. And, and you know, a part of, you know, what we're seeing is also to create this panic, you know. And um, because obviously something's wrong, I mean, they, they got to figure that we'd notice that our skies are being sprayed. I mean, it's in plain sight. So um, I just think that the best way we can just really anchor ourselves on the positive timeline is to develop ourselves from the inside out. To, to understand the, the, the pitfalls of the negative ego, to understand that unity consciousness means clearing that, coming together, giving each other respect and support, and um, not you know worrying about the facade and the outer stuff that we were taught is so important, and to just be more unified on a healing level, to, to be able to share in this healing process together, because it's a transformation that um, you know is going to take all of us. Right. Now... I know that, say, I mean, even for the past 40 years or more, uh, uh, we've been focused on exposing the dark, right? So that right now it's been part of exposing what's behind the catastrophic timeline. So we, we, we've given a lot of power to it. And, and uh, uh, so how do we shift from exposing the dark to, like, giving some airtime to the good. How do we find the good and how do we publish it? <laughs> well, I think you're the master of that. Um, <laughs> you've been talking about the positive timeline ever since I've known you. You've been putting stuff out there before that and yet you hit the truth home and you share like stuff that most people, you know, maybe want to run from. But um, I think it's that balance and you do that so beautifully is, is 
okay, you know, yes, it has been about exposing a lot of the dark stuff and, um, you know, also recognizing the light within that. People might call it fear-mongering or not to give it any attention, and I'm not in agreement to that. I think you have to step right into the worst-case scenario, into the thing that is the most uncomfortable thing to look at, and be right there in the center of it, be completely and totally present, and to remember who you truly are. Because once that happens, that light starts to engulf the darkness and starts to transmute the negative charge that's there, and it helps the dark to return to its real nature, which is the fertility of creativity. It's like the soil of the earth. It's dark. And it's rich, and it and, and it and it takes the seeds of higher consciousness, and it births new realities. But when the dark is unknown, and we fear it, all sorts of demons and all sorts of control agendas hide in there, and they pull the strings. So it's been so great to expose all this stuff because we're actually purifying it, we're knocking it out, we're clearing it out. Yes, it's not always fun, but when we do that, and now we're at the point of being in the center of it, now we get to rise and we get to feel empowered and we get to understand that we are both made of light and dark. And a part of integrating those two forces is not fearing the dark or um, being in denial because all those that think that this information is too much, their denial is the greatest form of fear. You know, don't fear it. If we fear our own demons, if we fear... Um, you know, the stuff within us that we need to clear, then we're not going to grow. We're just going to allow ourselves to get away with negative behavior patterns and addictions and all sorts of things. So if we have to face our own inner demons, we have to do that on a collective level. So now that we put it all out there and the cat's out of the bag and people can search the internet and find every horrifying thing that's happening under the sun, all sorts of disinformation and all sorts of truth, you know, it's the self and the self-awareness and the development of intuition that's going to help people to locate what truly resonates. And for us to rise out of a lot of the dark information that we found is to recognize that it truly has no power over us. For example, tomorrow is a big alignment with the Grand Cross. Mars is going to be linking with the Grand Cross. Most astrologers say this is probably, they don't have much good stuff to say about it because it's all extremely challenging aspects. The type of aspects that can create what seems to be even Armageddon scenarios, breakups, divorce, catastrophe. I've never felt better, and that's tomorrow, right? <laughs> that's so, April 11th, 2014, correct? Right, and it's going to be kind of on and off until 2015. And the thing is, just like a weather forecast, when we know what is kind of coming at us and we prepare, nothing can get in our way. So I use it, you know, astrology as a tool. It's not the end-all, be-all, and eventually we won't need it. It's, it's kind of like to help us graduate um, from the wheel of necessity that we're sort of still in right now. But the thing is, when we can start to have good days on days where the astrological alignments are a nightmare, it means that we become, and I posted this, masters of disaster. And when we're true masters of the disasters, we don't even notice them as being disasters anymore because we're rising and we're allowing it to push us into all that we are instead of tear us down. And the thing is, that concentration of energy that likes to you know, causes fear and constriction and pain and suffering is actually an opportunity to be pushed to the edge to have an incredible breakthrough and to rise again. And so this is what we're dealing with right now. And it's perfect that you asked that question because we're sitting right at a very important time astrologically where, you know, we have faced a lot of darkness. Now what are we going to do with it? What are we going to choose? We need to choose the fact that None of it ever had any power over us. And this is the great revelation of all time. And once we gain that perspective, our creative energy serves on our behalf to, cre to keep creating opportunities to prove to ourselves that nothing can stop us. And, um, and I like to play with this every day. No matter what negative experience I go through or what kind of weird energy hits, I, I, I love it. It's, it's a grand challenge to say, you know what? It's not strong enough and, it's not, and it has no power over me. And... I'm going to, you know, rise above it in this moment. And, and, and when we can focus on that and say to ourselves that this is where the real work is, instead of looking at it as a distraction or just having a weird day or an off day and we can just tackle it head on, we're really on the soul path. And we're not allowing all this news and all this other media stuff be what we think is reality because that's the distraction. There, there is one area that still for me, is a mystery, and maybe for others. And I think that you have plumbed it more, more than most of us, and that is the area of the archons, the archonic area. Because uh, most of us really don't fully comprehend them. So now in this transformation that's occurring, what are the archons, and how is it that that 
they are dimensional invasion and what is what is moving them out of the way or transforming them well to me they're like the byproduct of a lot of archetypal disharmonies a lot of um the things that happened um just really like from from a long time ago there's a lot of different spiritual theories out there um but a lot of texts have been altered even the gnostic texts have been altered so it's a very difficult topic to get a grip on um, because sometimes the information isn't exactly what it seems. So in my deep inner journeying and just my own life experience, um, I just really come to the conclusion that the archons are the byproduct of disharmony, disunity, duality, negative ego. And because creation came from thought and the imagination, you know, and has created form, same with these negative energies and and this duality and these um, rebellions and the desire to be in competition with the supreme being that you know Lucifer represents and to take away the names let's call it our negative ego it can ruin our lives if we stay connected to it just like it can ruin the planet if we don't call it out and we enable it by kinda going along with the deception of the false light so the archons can only feed on the parts of ourselves that haven't fully woken up or become integrated. It feeds on the fact that we're very fragmented, we're traumatized, um, we have a lot of wounds, um, and we also, you know, want to appease a lot of that pain through, you know, false light temptations, you know, fame, wealth, greed, um, you know, having maybe a lot of attention from a lot of different lovers, you know, whatever it is, things that only our own soul journey can teach us about based on what it means to fall on our face and get back up again, which is what we have been given the opportunity to do having many, many lifetimes and incarnations to wear a bunch of different hats until we say, hey, this is what works for me. And it's not about some rule book from God or the, it's, it's, it's based on cause and effect. And in astrology, we see that in the North and South Node, which is what I focus on when I do readings. So the Archons can only really grab onto what we haven't breathed life into or what we haven't fully become conscious of because our unconscious energy is what's being used against us and that's archonic. The archonic system feeds on us when we are unconscious. When we become conscious we recognize that unconscious energy is actually spiritual energy and when we wake up to that spiritual energy we become highly creative and we are able to create miracles and we think miracles are just some lucky thing and only some people can do them. Everybody can. And so the archons just feed on the fact that we think much less of ourselves than what we truly are and the agendas that come from these archonic systems are to perpetuate these belief systems that keep us down and they feed on us like parasites they're mind parasites they get in there and they exacerbate everything and the fact is they have technologies to make it even worse smart meters all sorts of things to create scenarios so there's a lot of conflict because they disrupt the frequencies and the frequencies that are all disruptive create sort of a static so that the natural energy flow of connection can't really happen and that's why people find when they watch TV they might fight with their partner immediately after or when they get home from a nice trip in the country and they're back where their smart meter is everything gets tense and everybody just feels like they're just gonna like ah get into a huge um, disagreement and and you almost have to just stop yourself and remember and almost laugh and say you know what you know these are just energies that we're dealing with we're dealing with cell towers we're dealing with all sorts of things going on with our phones surveillance and all sorts of like you know really obnoxious things but we're much greater than all of it we just have to not be weakened to it because it's all archonic and you know and the thing is it feeds on um, where we haven't fully resolved you know these wounds as well so for us to get over you know the archons is to tackle the inner work and to completely devote oneself to it because once we fill ourselves up with who we truly are and we stand in that power it doesn't have anything to feed off of it it can't find a host and when that happens it ends up kind of dying away and falling away the beings that represent it you know we already know about you know can can either become grays automations and um to keep themselves alive they just keep cloning in themselves and keep cloning themselves and that's the difference between somebody or or a being that has stayed immersed in the archonic deception or is the um maybe an enabler of it compared to a person that we might end up making contact with as a future human self who is a divine radiant light being that um, we could call an ascended master but of course there there's manipulated ascended masters that are archonic that people channel and they get you know the wrong information and that's another trap is the new age deceptions so we have to see that everywhere we turn is either a trap or a potential um, deception or or uh, 
a problematic area and that's why the only real place to turn is ourselves and so as disturbing as everything might be we have to also see it as liberating basically the only vote we can really give is to ourselves and in doing that we're we're functioning together more from our authentic genuine nature and and the leaders that come into play is embodying that as well because we know who to empower into office and who not to um because we can't get out of you know the woodwork just yet we're still dealing with you know having to undo a lot of the damage so it's going to take you know playing a little bit of the game but but on our own terms in in integrity and the thing is you know in this process of really waking up to ourselves we we know what to discard and what to keep and so it's just like archons it's just like parasites anything that is wanting to feed off of the life force of another that's cut itself off from source is basically an archon and so when we plug into our higher self when we plug into the heart nature of universal love what can possibly invade that just like when we're balanced we don't get sick parasites, germs, viruses, we don't have a hard time with and even if we do get sick we end up getting stronger so even if we are dealing with archonic attacks, even if we have dealt with psychic attack and um, we have gotten immersed into the negatives it's the process of healing and moving beyond it that makes us so incredibly strong because then what do we get to do? We get to help others out so it doesn't matter where we are in the game as long as we wake up eventually we start to unwind the entanglements and um, the healing result is phenomenal and and that's what this shift is into higher earth energies now let you you speak about uh this this transitional time very important key transitional time from 2014 to 2017 what do you see on the other side of 2017 well i think it's going to be a little bit different you know depending on who a each person, um, you know, their own orientation, what frequency they hold, what their vibration is. You know, we're dealing with um, obviously soul pods and groups and, um, you know, alliances to where, you know, one person in that group can wake up and everybody else feels it, you know, kind of like the hundredth monkey. Um, then we're dealing, you know, with those that will never ever want to look at this information that have immersed themselves more and more into the transhumanism agenda. We can't snap our fingers and make that go away right away. So I, I feel that we're dealing with a bifurcation. We're going to deal with sort of this phantom earth that isn't really functioning um, in connection with source, but is being run more on these uh, technologies that are sourcing and using and siphoning um, free energy from us and the planet, but that's in a lower dimensional um, aspect of the multi-dimensional creation um, that will end up ceasing to exist and expiring because it's not able to maintain anything and even if it does remain in existence um, it, it's like a spider web only those that are, are vulnerable will end up being a part of the experience to either break free of it and see it for what it is or be immersed in it until the inner spark that's within all of us ends up coming out. But beyond 2017, for those that are really conscious and awake and devoted to the path, I see that um, the nature of life and death is completely different. We are able to come and go from the physical as we please. We can choose to be spirit guides and assisting those that are still having a tough time getting out of whatever um, uh, trap of, of, of this, this mind control system that, that is already in play, the transhumanism and all that kind of stuff. Um, we're multidimensional beings and I think that the possibilities are endless. I mean, I see that, you know, we're artists of energy and our thought forms, our beliefs, our, 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 our vibration is, is everything, just like when we dream at night. You know, we're, we're in this grand dream, we're dealing with Gaia's dream and we're also dealing with the nightmare um, invasion that is basically dream warfare like we've talked about before which is taking our creative imagination and turning it into something it doesn't need to be so that's gonna end up playing out until enough is enough for whatever individuals immersed in it but what's available and what I see for most of us is that the ripples of awakening are going to connect to so many people that have an open heart and an open mind that it'll help them to remove themselves and if the numbers are enough which I think they will be the transhuman agenda and and that potential phantom earth might not even actually happen but there is a chance that it will and if that's the case I see a bifurcation happening and because it's so hard to predict um, you know I think eventually the inevitable 
outcome is that that will be called um, out completely and totally by the free will choices of any human that's a part of it to where they don't have anything to feed on anymore to where that they can't even exist. And until that happens, it's going to be there, but it's not going to entrap souls anymore that are awake and conscious and that we now can remove ourselves and that the contract that we've had to be here for 26,000 years plus to, to live out the fact that um, the geophysics haven't been such that the natural stargates could open until this window period because now it is opening, this is our chance to move on. It hadn't been the case and this is why we keep incarnating um, and a lot of, you know, highly conscious beings, you know, have been entrapped here. I mean, the, the, the fact that a lot of souls have been trapped is real. No matter how conscious you are, we have been trapped in this incarnation cycle. This window period represents our ability to graduate, to move beyond the wheel. The wheel of necessity for the good of our souls and the manipulations that can stunt our ability to wake up to who we truly are. And that that opportunity is here now. If we miss that opportunity... The 3D experience is another 26,000 year cycle. Now, several years ago, you made a conscious decision not to go to Mars and Alternative 3, to stay here on Earth with your fellow Earthlings to establish and move forward on Alternative 4. And we're all very grateful that you made that decision. What, what words, finally, uh, would you like to leave share with our viewers uh, at this kind of historic time? Oh, gosh. Um, I just, I'm grateful that I, I just stayed true to myself. And as difficult as some of these decisions are, you know, based on a lot of the different things that are presented in order to manipulate one, I also recognize that that's part of the game and part of what, you know, Eisenhower was dealing with. Um, you know, a part of the patriotic programming and a part of this is the right thing to do and really the right thing to do is just do what you feel is the best thing. And if your intentions are in alignment with wanting the greatest good for yourself and for everybody else and for the planet, I don't think you can go wrong. And I just, you know, really encourage people to do the same because there are no mistakes when your heart's in the right place. And if we can all just be more heart-centered, I feel that, you know, we, we just have a tremendous opportunity to unify and raise the vibration of this planet and to really just have these dark forces and these other, you know, agendas um, either wake up or get lost. And I just, I, I, I love, you know, the process we're in and I just feel such good energy ahead of us and with the kind of alignments we're ha having and, and, you know, the sort of things that are playing out, I, I feel like we're two steps ahead of them and, and the wave is in our favor. And I'm just grateful for everybody, for their open minds and hearts and for giving themselves the credit of, embracing the truth of what they're made of and the beauty and the divinity that we all hold that we're beginning to really share uh, together. And just so much gratitude, you know, to you, Alfred, because um, you, you know, helped me really get my stuff out there and you've been an incredible friend and ally. So it's really oh, good to be here. You. Th th thank you. And, and we really want to thank you for taking time today to be w with us. And we hope that in the future, as, as we move through this through this window, you'll be able to come back from time to time and share your wisdom with us. Thank you so much.